So today, what we're going to do is we're going to think about how we fill our inner libraries and find compelling, what I've called compelling books after you know, Violet buller -Wire's, um phrase that she used that I shared with you in the last session. And I, I don't know if you can see here, but I love this um, photograph because it's a bit like some of you might know of the books which are called Where's Wally? But if you look very closely here at this um, photograph, you can see there's something that doesn't quite belong in there. Uh, if any of you can spot who's the odd one out, then put it in the chat. And um, that's why I put that there, because sometimes it feels like looking for books that tempt one that are great books, especially in um, settings where they, we don't have that many resources, is like finding the, um, the odd one out, if you like. Um, so anyone see who's who's in there? Shall I, shall I show you? There's a little a little bird uh, in the middle there. So before we carry on with today, we start something new. Let's just recap. I talked last week particularly about the way that play and story work together and how um, our brains um, use play to learn. And so play is one of those crucial ingredients for young children and when they're um, when they're beginning to learn anything and particularly learning to read because play and story have this powerful link. Um, and also um, that along with that then goes um, imagination, which sometimes we tend to see imagination as an optional extra. Um, and it's like, oh, go use your imagination when you go and play, go play after you've done your work. But actually, imagination is part of work. And I'm going to actually find some nice um, bits to read for those of you who are interested and share on the WhatsApp um, more about imagination, because I do think it's crucial and it isn't uh, it's often it isn't that well uh, looked after. So linked to all of that is the fact that we have to be motivated and compelling or compelling stories or great stories or however we want to describe the stories um, that speak to us. Those are the ones that we connect to emotionally. And so we need to be finding them because we are our children's role models. They will um, watch very closely, even when we don't know they're watching, they're observing us. And they almost as if by osmosis through the air, they breathe in the way that we do things culturally and socially and reading and writing are social and cultural practices. So we have to be the role models. We have to also remember, and I mentioned it last week, I'll also share more about this for those of you who are interested, is that the concepts of print, the early learning that happens when a child is becoming a reader, um, they are taught and learned often informally on the laps of adults or with other family members or friends. They are though being taught and they are being learnt, and we sometimes um, do not notice that. So today, though, it's the thing of how do we equip ourselves? How do we grow our inner library? And I went on a hunt looking for things, and I found these wonderful proverbs. And also I thought that as we're talking about nurturing ourselves to become the role models, that we needed the rain rather than the fire and um, found these proverbs from Africa, a little rain each day will fill the rivers to overflowing. And I love that, just a little rain each day. And then you get the great big overflowing rivers. And then along with that, we have to think about which books to nurture, if we think about the books as the little bit of rain, um, we also know that, and this is another proverb, that mothers are really important, mothers, fathers, caregivers, the good mother knows what her children will eat. 
okay, will eat. And that implies, this Ghanaian proverb, implies that the mother knows her children. And um, that is something, again, <clears throat> in my understanding of how children learn, um, we need to be very careful observers, curious observers of our children. And we will find out, and we did it in the first session, that caring, caring, emotional relationship, though that is the most important thing in terms of getting to know people. And so, um, so let's look, how do we nurture children with books? Where do we find the books that we eventually choose to use? Do we have the luxury of choosing or do we just use whatever comes our way? I want to start <clears throat> with this book called Eco Girl by um, Ken Wilson Max. He's a Zimbabwean writer. Um, he lives, I think, partly in Zimbabwe, but also in the UK. Um, I put up this um, slide for you to show you, <clears throat> sorry, that this is actually a book that is available at the moment in South Africa. It costs 130 Rand, which is a lot for, for, for many people. However, if one can know what books are available, one can find ways of ordering them, of getting them. I've got a very squeaky chair today. I hope it's not disturbing you. <laughs> um, so Eco Girl, Ken Wilson Max, it's available as you see there in Afrikaans, English, Isikosa and Isizulu. And if there was a demand, Jakarta publishers who published this book would make it available in other languages. So first thing I would do when I'm looking at a book is I, I look at, and we all do, I know, look at the cover and we think, hmm, eco girl, eco girl. I wonder what that means. I wonder what, why it's eco girl. Um, and maybe you see the little plant in her hands and you think, oh, okay, eco, hmm, maybe ecology, I don't know. Um, and, and one could look at this. I know that covers are often talked about by teachers that they should be looking at the covers with the children. I think yes, but not to the extent that the children start nodding off or, or disappear. Um, I'm going to read some of this book to you. I don't know if I'll get through the whole thing. Now, can you see it is the question? Yes. Eco Girl by Ken Wilson Mapp. So, so beautiful, bold um, colors and um, seems like he's painted his um, visuals for this book. So it's a little girl called Zenzele. And Zenzele lived at the edge of a big old forest with trees as far as she could see. She loved the forest and all the animals and birds in it, but she loved the trees most of all. Her favorite was the baobab tree. Zenzele wondered if the trees talked to each other. Did they know who she was? I wonder why she wondered that they talked to each other. Well, you can, you can see the trees over there. Maybe they look a bit sort of as if they might be able to talk to her. I wish I was a baobab tree so I could talk to the trees, said Zenzela one day at breakfast. Being a tree is all about patience, little sprout, said Mama. I can be patient, said Zenzela, as she waited for her juice. That afternoon, Baba told Zenzele how each tree had its own special part to play in the world, taking care of animals, <clears throat> birds, and people. I can look after birds too, said Zenzele, putting some seeds on the windowsill. Can we see that? On the day before Zenzele's birthday, Mama Mama, Baba, and Zenzele were going to visit Gogo, deep in the forest. At the end of the road, Mama said, everybody out, even little sprouts. I'm not a sprout, said Zenzele. Okay, my feisty, 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 even when you speak English, you don't always know how to pronounce a word. Okay, my feisty forest fairy, what's bigger than a sprout? asked Mama. 
a sapling, giggled Senzele, standing as tall as she could. They walked for a long time with trees all around them. Senzele wanted to ask if they were nearly there, but she remembered to be patient like a tree. At last, they turned a corner and there was Gogo. Senzele ran to, to her Gogo. Gogo, would you talk to me if I was a baobab tree? Of course I would, little sprout, laughed Gogo. Trees need lots of love and care. I'm a sapling now, Senzele said proudly. Well, saplings need even more love and care, Gogo gave Senzele a big hug. And tomorrow is a special day. Next morning was Senzele's birthday. It was raining, but she ran Outside, she listened to the hissing rain, then stood like a tree and felt the warm raindrops tap tapping on her hands. She watched the water mix with the red soil. Tired plants lifted up their leaves and reached for the sky. It looked like magic. When the rain stopped, Gogo came out. She was holding something wrapped in bark. What's that? Asked Senzele, trying to see inside. Shall we go and find out? Said Gogo with a cheeky grin. And they all followed Gogo into the forest. They came to a place where the sun shone down through the tree tops. Through tree tops. It felt like magic. This is where your new life starts, little sapling, said Gogo, picking up a pebble. She gave Zenzele the bark parcel. Zenzele unwrapped a little plant and a spade. There you can see the, the plant and the spade. She stroked the green leaves. What is it? she asked. Patience, said Gogo with a big smile. Dig a small hole with the spade, put in the plant, and then set the pebble next to it. I don't know if you saw that. Wonder why the pebble's going next to it. There's... When the little plant was in the earth, Zenzele laid down the pebble. Then Gogo said, This is a baobab seedling. It will grow into a sprout, then a sapling like you. It is next to your Baba's tree, which stands next to my tree, and my tree stands next to my mama's tree. All these trees were planted by our family. One day, yours will be as big as the other trees in the forest. Gogo hugged Zenzele. Can you love and care for your baobab tree so it grows big and healthy like Baba's tree? Zenzele felt very proud. She stood next to her little baobab tree and called out, Yes, I can. And Mama, Baba and Gogo all said, Happy birthday, eco girl. And then at the back, that's the end of the story. There's a bit that says, what can you find out about trees? So that's, that's Eco Girl. And I read through it, um, I would say, having read it two or three times to myself. Now, you, you might have seen that I actually didn't read it all that well. Um, I, I didn't practice it enough to be, <clears throat> I would say, fluent so that... Um, so that I let all the sentences flow as I think they should have flown. And that's actually one of the, one of the big lessons about reading aloud is that one really needs to be able to, one needs to know the story so that you're able to predict yourself what's coming next. And um, I mean, I did that purposefully now because it's a new book for me and I thought I'd just show you what it, what it feels like when you're actually not that um, you're not that fluent with the book, but at the same time, 
Um, <clears throat> I thought that it's it's really a beautiful book to share with 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 young children. I'm not sure who you would want to share that book with, but you could maybe put it in the um, in the chat if you feel like saying who do you think that book is is good for. Um, there's some vocabulary there. I just picked out two things here on the same page as, okay, my face, the forest fairy, when it will be interesting for um, African language speakers to see how that is translated into, um, is it Koso or is, is it Zulu? I think it says that this book's available in, because that's a particularly English um, phrase. But so th there's often a question with, with, with books for young children is, what happens when the vocabulary is new or difficult? So maybe a child doesn't know what a sprout is. Maybe they don't know what a sapling is. Um, one of the things I, I would just say as a principle is that we need to raise children's, um, children's uh, vocabulary uh, we need to raise it. We need to raise it in the sense that we are trying to grow vocabulary, I should have said, not raise. And so in that sense, we we don't need to be afraid of vocabulary that seems difficult. So even the face the forest fairy, good for me to say, oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, one could go and look online if you could. And actually, it doesn't really matter too much as long as you know what it means. And the more or less that children often know. They know more or less what something means. And gradually over time, they get to know the, the, the bigger meaning. Obviously with sprouts and saplings, one could then say, what are sprouts? You could go and look at a sprout. You could, um, I just had that picture of sprouts. It's not a great one for a tree, but you could then go and find saplings and sprouts um, with your child so that they really do have a, uh, 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 hands-on understanding of the meaning of the words because remember I've already said to you the non-compartmentalism we want holism we want to link always link Friedrich Froebel said connecting to um, to children's lives um, so what trees are around them we can find out about the trees in this book in Eco Girl and then for me now, being the searcher of, uh, of good books, I looked at that and I thought, oh, yeah, I read that you can see here Wangari Matai, um, who planted all those trees in Kenya. Um, I went looking and I then found, actually, I had these. I found these other two books, which are about Wangari um, the one's called Wangari's Tree of Peace and the other one's more of a, a, a sort of a non-fiction book about her life. They both are about her life and they link beautifully to Eco Girl. And so you can sort of go down the pathway, um, gaining new knowledge as you go along with the children. And I am going to... Um, share on the on the link this this story which is the uh, the one called Wangari's Tree of Peace because I found it online and it's it's freely available so I, I'll share it with you those of you who interested so the whole thing is curiosity information knowledge we can find out about baobab trees these great trees of Africa um we can uh, you know just by googling and so when you start with one story, you really can go um, much further than the story itself. Now, I was just thinking um, for people, you know, how do I how do I read this story? Because sometimes you don't have a, a book particularly for a baby or for a toddler or, you know, or for the age group. Remember, every drop of rain fills us up, fills our children up. So we don't want to wait until we have the right books. We just can't do that. So if I, I actually think this is a lovely book that I would share with a baby. And in fact, um, I would share many books with babies because babies just love the sound of the mother's voice. So the baby would be really um, just communing with your voice and they wouldn't really necessarily understand but you might say 
Ooh, look who's there. Look at that. Look, eyes. And look, it's got a plant. And you'd be talking to them. And you would not be expecting a, a, a small baby or even a six-month, eight-month-old baby to necessarily understand everything or even you wouldn't need to be going. You might go. You might go, eco girl. And, and you might show them eco girl because, you know, why not? Certainly with a toddler to a three-year-old, you would do that. Um, and then you wouldn't, though, with a baby, read all this text unless the baby's just very small and you just feel like reading a story out loud. You wouldn't be reading it to give her the, or him the story. But with a toddler, you'd probably try and tell the story um so you'd need to know the story maybe and say it's zenzele she loves the trees look she's looking at the trees which trees can you see those are baobab trees and zenzele is looking out of her window at the trees in the forest something like that and then zenzele says to her mum her mama she says i wish i was a baobab tree and then you could say, ha, huh, isn't that funny? Can a person be a tree? I mean, you could say that just to get a bit of humor in because children, all of us love humor, actually, and particularly little then the four and five-year-olds and the three and four-year-olds love to imagine that you were a tree. Next thing you'd have your child pretending to be a tree on the floor. Um, and then... Um, the sprout thing you could talk about with the with the children. You could, if it was a baby, say, "Oh, look, yummy bananas!" And I wonder what that is—an avocado pear, maybe. Little girl's having her juice. Senzel is going to drink her juice. Do you want your juice? Do you want your banana? You try and connect the child to it um, as you go along, and then, oh, look, little bird. What does the bird say? Tweet, 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 says the bird. And there's Zenzele's daddy. And she's giving seeds to the bird. She's giving the bird seeds to eat. And um, what do you want to eat when you're hungry? Do you eat bird seeds? No, we don't eat birds, but maybe we eat sunflower seeds. You know, you just have a conversation around the pictures in the book. And this is the same kind of thing that you could do. Um, if you were an adult who didn't read this language or you didn't read at all, you could, because the research tells us very clearly, and it's actually obvious, if you think of what I shared with you about the emotional connection and the relationship, that it is this relationship around the text that is so enriching and so rewarding for children, for young children for toddlers, for babies, for all of them. It's that, that special time with you. And what the book does for the adult is it gives you um, a, a topic almost. It gives you, it, it's a text that guides you or that um, somebody, I can't remember who it is, talked about texts that teach. I mean, the texts do teach, but it's also just a guide for you because it, it brings up things that you can then imagine, talk about, think about, and connect to your own circumstances. Okay, I hope that's um, useful. So one can then also, as I already did with um, Wangari, you can find other books on similar themes. And here, for example, I have this book. Um, so I thought I'd just use this in, as an example. It's a nice book. It's It's got these very vivid illustrations as well. Um, it is available. Penguin Random House published it, unfortunately, only in English. And again, I think that um, publishers, if there was a demand for these books in other languages, they would print them because they want the money, obviously. So this this story, Lena the Doka and the Dragonfly, is is uh, uh, different, and it's it's got far more um, 
text than um, Eco Girl has. It's about a little girl who um, she's also talking about a grandfather, and her grandfather talks to animals, um, and she's talking, and 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 she goes. They go to to see the the grandfather, and um, there's a whole adventure there which I can't really go into now, but just. Um, have a bit of a look. There's an animal who's hurt a poach in a poacher's trap, and um, it's all also about going deep into the forest and how the grandfather always finds the way because the dragon, the dragonfly, helps him find the way. And um, so, as you can see, it's got these very amazingly vivid um, illustrations, and it's. It's a story which is connecting to the idea of the first people and so on. So there you go. That's that one. Um, if it were me reading that, that wouldn't be a book that I would read to children who are not used to being read to, um, unless they're older. Young children who are not used to being read to can't cope with a lot of text. Um, they have to, it, it kind of grows on them, that focus and that concentration grows on them um, with time and with experiencing lots of books. So there we go. So um, today I want to share with you some of the sources that I've found. You know, where do we find books? Especially if we're in South Africa or other African settings. Now, we do have online, and we'll look at some of the online resources. Publishers in South Africa, we're very lucky with publishers. Um, we do have um, a lot of publishers, not, not many of them, not all of them, although more and more publish in all the South African languages. Um, I'm going to give you, you'll, you'll get the, this list, so I'm not actually going to spend time on this too much, but one of the things I wanted to say is that um, we have this phenomenon here and in other parts of Africa, I, sh I should think, where the, a print run of books happens. And then once that print run is um, used up or bought or given away, um, the book goes out of print. So you have these wonderful books that, that we can't get hold of. Now, this having an audio library has actually done something unintentionally and that is may that it makes some of those books available to children to at least listen to now even if they're out of print so i'm i'm very excited about bib as a phenomenon in in south africa and in africa there other there's another one which i'll show you in a little while um, so Bib is this new one. Here you go. I played a little bit of something the other day, but for example, here's a story about Custer Semenya, um, which, uh, just have a listen. Before I see, it is time to pray. We pray every night for food and safety. Coco prays that we will lead good lives and that I will be the fastest girl in the world. I dream I am running somewhere very far from home. I dream that I am the fastest girl in the world. I dream that I win a gold medal. Coco wakes me up and says, Okadi, it is time to go to church. Yeah, so so that's, this book is available. So you can get this book. I think it's also published by Jakana. It's a... It, it is available, but the added dimension of being able to listen to it is wonderful. Um, at the moment, I think you get you you it's FNB and you get is it ebooks or something, and one can get books like that. They are working out a way to make more free books available, especially for for children. So I'm 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 not involved with them, but I'm hoping and pushing that. I, whenever I speak to anyone, I try and say, do that. Yes, do that. Make these Before books free. Sorry. So, and here, another example. So the magic fish, I'm not sure if the magic fish is in or out of print at the moment, but it is available online. And 
that is rather low. So wait, 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 wait. Let me not do that. Let me first. I just wanted you to be able to read and listen. I've only got. The fisherman was not happy, but he went to the seashore. When he got there, the water looked muddy and brown. He stood at the water's edge and said, Oh, princess of the sea, listen to me. My younger brother has sent me to beg a favor of you. Then the silver fish appeared and asked, What does your brother want? He says that when I caught you, I should have asked you for something, said the fisherman. He does not like living in a grass hut. He wants a house made of bricks. <laughs> said the fish. He is in the house already. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this in, I think I'm not sure exactly how many languages, but I think in at least five, um, these, not only this book, a lot of books are available at the same time as these books might not be in print. So we want them in print, but we also want children to grow these stories in their heads. So this is um, this is a good addition. Um, and then, you know, how do I grow my inner library? I go on researches. That's what I did to get, you know, what I've shown you this far done. I get very involved in looking for things. So if you have access to the internet, um, you can have lots of fun getting to know books um, that way. There's this site called Sur la Laine Fa Fairy Tales. So this is not, um, not South African or not African, but it's got all these fairy tales. And I was just going to share with you that sometimes one actually runs into the sand when one's trying to find something, because I got very excited finding an African, um, another African version of this story, um, which is called Wanta and the Shapeless Thing. And then, and it's from Cameroon, but then I discovered that it's, you can't get hold of it. It's it's not allowed because of um, you know copyright issues. So sometimes you can't get what you want, but you find other things along the way. So what have we got in Africa? Um, and this is actually on the continent and also by others off the continent up north uh, about Africa. There's this amazing site, which I found called Aku Books, um, and it's a listening library as well. And I think they link to um, African-American um, organizations or the university, or I'm not exactly sure what, but there's a, there's a connection and it's, it's um, a way of getting audio books from other parts of Africa as well. Unfortunately, all of this, most of this, you have to pay for when you finally get to getting the book. But I often search for what I can find that one can download, and that is free. Um, even if you can't get hold of a particular book, it is good to know, to, to build your inner library by getting to know what is out there in South Africa and and further afield. Um, Muna Kalati is a great organization which is promoting reading for children across Africa. I think they're based in Ghana and Cameroon. You, um, there's the Sub-Saharan Publishers. What's the time? Goodness, time is flying today. I'm not gonna finish today's session today. I'll have to do it next time. Um, Sub-Saharan Publishers is a very well-established Ghanaian publisher, and they, they, um, one of their great authors that they publish is Meshak Asari, who some of you will know of, I'm sure, 
And Meshach, Meshach Sari's, um, he, he has written a lot and his books are very um, highly thought of, his children's books. Um, and I'll, I'll share something about him on, on, on the WhatsApp group if you like. I have, sorry, this collection of his books and that you can get them from Sub-Saharan publishers. You might be able to get one or two of them in South Africa. Um, there, <laughs> this one's coming apart. It's been read so often, The Magic Goat. Um, anyway, I've shown you that there. I'll just read a tiny bit of Cat in Search of a Friend to you, just to get a sense of this. This one is one that one could read to young children very easily, I think. Some of his books are, are quite, um, have got a lot of text, more text, and then again, you need children who have listening stamina, which is another good reason for having an audio library because you develop that listening stamina. So Cat in Search of a Friend is about a cat who had yellow fur. She also had a bushy yellow tail and eyes the color of honey. One thing she didn't have, however, was a friend with whom she could stay and who would protect her, and that made her sad. One day, she went to the little monkeys and asked them, do you want to be my friends? Okay, and this, so you can already see the pattern of the story being set up here, quite differently to the story that we read earlier on, the eco girl, which doesn't, re the pattern comes with the journey. This already, um, if you know children's books, when she says, will you be my friends? The monkeys say, why not? And, and okay, let me read this. You will never find better and stronger friends than us. So the cat with the yellow fur stayed with the monkeys and played with them until the chimpanzees came. Suddenly the little monkeys were afraid and ran away. So he set up a pattern. Now the chimpanzees are even stronger than the little monkeys, said the cat with the yellow fur to herself. So they will be better friends. And she stayed with the chimpanzees and played with them. Hmm, I wonder what's going to happen until the gorillas came. When the chimpanzees saw the gorillas, what did they do? That's right. They ran away, so and so on. So that that's a nice rhythmic, repetitious story that you can read um, to quite young children. Um, and Meshach Asari is he's he's unfortunately again only. I I stand to be corrected that I think he's only written. In English, although his books have been translated into a lot of languages, he kind of represented Africa out in the world with children's books for a long time. So they got translated into European languages. This is one of the things that we have to have to change in Africa, that, that the African authors who write, write for African children in Africa and in South Africa and in African languages as well. So here are um, South African NGOs who are offering reading materials in different languages, which are used across Africa. Some of them, the African Storybook Project, you would know, I think most people know about that. Um, big library of books, whether they are compelling. I think one has to search to find the compelling story, no matter who the organization is. Shine in, in, in South Africa, now I see have also a look and listen part, which is free on their website. So as long as you've got Wi-Fi, you can, with your child, you know, if you're doing it with a small group of children, I would tend not to put children in front of a screen and just leave them. I would tend to try and have a shared experience even on the screen. Sometimes that's not possible, but when you can. Puku, um, some of you will know, Puku does um, reviews of books in African languages in South Africa. So it's kind of like you can see what we have I don't think we still know what's actually available from Puku. And in fact, that is 
like I've already said, one of the big issues is that one doesn't know what is still in print. Okay, Funzas for, for older kids, teenagers. Book Dash, of course, is um, produces all these little, little storybooks, little quick storybooks, and they're doing it in all languages now. And these books are for, for young children, and they really um are the kind of little books that and they're available online and and um as physical books and they're the little books that can build up children's reading stamina quite quickly um Nali Bali most of you will know also Nali Bali has a big collection of multilingual stories so often in in in, in English and in an African language uh um combinations and um the um little versions of the cut out and keep books which are really very useful there's a huge collection of those and those were abridged by our very own arabella sitting here some in in the past anyway um so those are available on a big um online um, library, if you like. And then Pricer, our organization, we also have a collection of stories, rhyme cards, and so on for young children. And we have, um, we have, yeah, we have a range of, of material. So the, the message here really is to go and explore these, um, these websites, because it's only through by exploring them that you get to know what jumps out for you, what looks interesting to you, and what you might like to use. Um, other useful places, um, IBI South Africa, some of you will know IBI South Africa. It's, um, it's a chapter, as we call it, of, a, of an international organization. IBBY stands for International Board on Books for Young People. And they really, um, they give out awards, they, they, they um, do, um, they fund small projects to do with book sharing and to do with reading. Um, if you don't know the EB website, uh, I'll, I'll I've got the international one coming up shortly. I would go to it because it is a way actually of funding a small project with reading with children. It's fantastic actually, and it's a good organization because you can get to know what's out there in the rest of the world. There's something like 65, 70 uh, different countries um, who, are, who attach to IBI, even more maybe, I don't know. Um, this is just, just giving you examples. Book, book, book shops, the book lounge is a great one in Cape Town to go and just browse, to just go and look at books because you have to become a browser <laughs> in order not to use your browser to become a browser to to get to know what's out there and what's available and what fits into what genres and so on the bookery donates libraries and i think we even have some bookery people with us or we did um same with bibliof donates mother tongue books so you know if you don't know about these possibilities of donations um, these are good places to go to. Huh. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Does anyone want to say anything? I feel like I've been talking too much. Hi, Carol. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, sorry, it's Naila. Yeah, I just want to ask, are those um, people that donate books to organizations or places looking for donations? Um, these, the bookery and, and Biblionef donate yeah. to, um, it could be, it, they donate to, to organizations and I stand to be corrected. I think, mm -hmm. um, reading clubs as well, okay. people who are reading with children. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, you know, on my search um, for this session, I just came across all these amazing stories that I thought I'd share with you quickly, um, which are really, to me, that I've always loved folk tales and fairy tales. So, so I'm sharing what I love with you. Um, they, they may not strike you as they strike me, but I find it absolutely 
fascinating how there are stories, there are versions of stories around the world that um, have the idiom and the metaphor of the of the culture where they come from or they originate, but they're basically telling stories of great human themes. Um, and, and, and Cinderella, which we all know, and sometimes one feels desperate that children seem to only know Cinderella, three little pigs, uh, the three bears and so on, in an African country, which is so rich in its own um, stories. There are African Cinderella stories, and I don't even like talking about Cinderella stories because really these stories could have originated elsewhere and become Cinderella. So, so Chinye and Natiki and Mufaro are all kind of um, on the same themes that Cinderella are, and you might like to just go and listen to Chinye or you can watch it. It's a lovely um, visual storytelling of Chinye. Um, it's, it's done by the Story Museum, which is a, a story museum in, in Oxford in the UK. I think we must use resources when they're available and bring them into our own space and make them our own in our own way. So I'm not, I'm eclectic. I don't only want to find things that are, that start off here. In fact, they took Chinye and, and are telling it there. So we've got to get it back here, you know, that's how I see it. And I found this um, great website, which has got 365 Cinderella versions. Um, and I'll share one on, on the, on the WhatsApp group. Um, Natiki is the Namibian story, and there's also a visual tales of the motherland there. You can watch it, um, which I found. But then in our very own Madiba Magic, where is it? Um, there is the Natiki story. Um, I was going to read you a bit of it, but I'm not sure that I should at this point. Arabella, can you guide me? Should I should I be coming to a close? Is she there? This is the Natiki story. Sorry, um, yes, I am here, Carol. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I think it's fine to read it, and then we can always stop in a few minutes and just finish off the last of this. But next week, you've got about eight minutes left. Yeah, I think so. So, where okay. is the Natiki story? So, I don't know. Do do people know this story? And if anybody would would actually like to read, I've I've got a bit of a cold and I I feel like I'm not reading very well. I have it here. Okay, let me see if I can see it here. The Natiki. So this is um, Namibia, I think. I think it's set in Namibia. The Kalahari evening sun sinks away behind the thorn trees. The hunters come back from the felt. At the kraal, people are talking and laughing. Natiki's two sisters and her mother rub their bodies with fat. They are making themselves beautiful because tonight is the dance of the full moon. Natiki's heart is burning to go along to the big dance as well. But when she asks her mother whether she can go too, her mother only says, go and fetch the goats and make sure you bring them in before nightfall. Bring along some wood and make a big fire so that the wild animals will stay away. Her mother and her two sisters treat, treat Natiki very, very badly. They are jealous of her because she is more beautiful than her two older sisters. And they are afraid that a young hunter might take a fancy to her at the dance. So Natiki goes out into the felt. By the time she comes back to the kraal with the goats, her mother and sisters have already left for the dance. She places the handful of porcupine quills she has collected on the wall of the cooking enclosure. She breaks up the wood, she lays the fire and lights it. Next, she rubs fat on her body until her skin looks like burnished copper. She, she brushes her hair with a thorn twig and rubs a yellow mixture of crushed bark and fat on her face. Around her neck are beads made of ostrich eggshell. She threads strings of beads through her hair and ties, ties dried springbok ears filled with seeds onto her legs. Last of all, she places the porcupine quills 
in her little leather pouch. The moon is already high when she sets off along the path. Here and there, as she walks, she sticks a porcupine quill into the ground. When she comes to the top of the rise and sees the big fire of the dance, she starts to feel a bit nervous. What will her mother and sisters say? But then she smells the meat on the coals and her feet skip this way and that, and the springbuck ears go around her ankles. When she gets to the fire, she stands to one side at first. Then she catches sight of her mother and her sisters. But they are wandering along with the other woman who has arrived at the party alone and a stranger. See, I read that badly. But they are wandering along with the other woman who had who has arrived at the party so alone and a stranger. So they're wondering who she is. <laughs> Sorry. But you see, actually, you know, uh, I just wanted to read this last paragraph. Natiki goes to stand with the women who are sit- singing and clapping their hands. She joins in the singing. She claps her hands and her feet are light. A young hunter smiles at her as he dances past. His eyes rest on her. Okay, so you have to read the rest for yourself. But, you know, what I wanted to say is when one makes a mistake or one doesn't read so well with children they are very very um accommodating listeners always so you know i i I do think sometimes one is reading as performance and one is always trying to read in a way that captures the attention of your listeners and bringing them along with you but I don't think one has to feel like you have to be a perfect reader but you you have to be able to move the story along. And the other thing I wanted to say about this is that I do think, again, this is reinforcing what I said earlier, that young children should um, be exposed to language which is above the level of their own competence. And I think this is one of the big mistakes that we make in classrooms for young children when Um, particularly, but not only for all young children, but particularly for children who have not had the opportunities to listen to the language of stories, to, to the language of books in their home environments. Because if we then restrict them to the leveled books of the leveled readers, the leveled language of readers, we are not allowing them to use their plasticity in their brains remember, to grow their, their, their knowledge of the language of books, of expressions, of metaphor, of, of, of the rich language that, that we get in stories. So children do not have to understand everything. They have to understand the flow of the story. And they, there's still words that I do not fully understand when I read sometimes, and then I go and look them up. I think, I think I know what that is. And especially when I'm writing, a word comes to mind and I think, but I actually don't know exactly what that word means. And then I go and look. So you have the whole experience of the words in context, which is what gives them their meaning. And then when you need the particular meaning of a word, you go to it and you look at it. So I just wanted to make that point with this wonderful story and then to end with um, Mufaro's beautiful daughters. Now Mufaro, um, I think it's a Zimbabwe um, story, uh, the Zimbabwe version as well. It was written by this guy called John Steptoe and I landed up finding out all about John Steptoe. It's really interesting actually. Um, You can go online and have a reading of it by somebody, I'm not sure who. Um, and also it's back into that Sula Lane fairy tales. But here, we can't read it, but uh, here are some of the images from this book. John Steptoe was one of the first, if not the first, um, African-American um, writers. He was very young. He wrote the, this book and others, and he illustrated for African-American children in at the time, because he wanted them to re to connect with their African heritage, and I mean, this is a book that I think was available here. It was written in the nineteen eighties. 
I think it's very beautiful. And it does it, I think it is available somewhere in the world, but not in South Africa. So I'm sorry about that. But if you hunt online, you might find it. <laughs> <laughs>